I am rich but poor, bitter but sweet. I am hard to know, but easy to meet. I've been a jailer, a protector, a stranger, a friend, a lie, an illusion, a means to an end. I shrink and I die in all but few cases, yet seem to grow in the most unusual places. And if you are lucky, if you scale that wall, then one day your children will not know me at all. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I get a gong to introduce me like the gong in our lobby, I think. Wonderful. Welcome to uh, the fourth in our installment of Fireside Chats at the San Francisco Playhouse Empathy Gym. I'm Bill English, our artistic director, and I'm really thrilled to have you join us. Uh, as you can, as you can kind of tell from that um, wonderful, wonderful. madly in love with it, thought it was the best play I'd ever read. And I went, met Lauren and we talked about it and I think a campaign for two or three years. And uh, am I having a problem, Donnie? Okay. And so uh, finally, we were able to get the rights to do In A Word. And what a thrill it was. We got Giovanni Sardelli to direct and Lauren was here with us. And we worked on that play for quite a while. And then the play subsequently won the Will Glickman Award for Best Play. And then uh, while we were doing uh, In a Word, Lauren said, hey, could I do a reading of a, of a work in progress play that, I, that I've been working on? And could we use your theater to do it? And I think it was a Playwrights Foundation rough reading series. Okay. So we put up that, that play and uh, it was the beginnings of King of the East. And of course, I immediately fell in love again and uh, campaigned for another two or three years to get to do King of the Yeast, which we got to do. So super thrilled to have Lauren Yee join us here on our fireside chat. How are you Thank doing? Thank you for having me. Um, we're, we're all healthy and um, I'm constantly in conversation with my family in San Francisco. Um, so so I'm, I'm very relieved how you guys are uh, doing more or less over there. I'm, I'm in, I, however, I'm um, in New York on the, on the other side of the country. Yeah. You're a long ways away. Yep. Yeah. Well, your dad, who I met at that very first reading mm -hmm. of, of King of the Yees, he was there uh, in the afternoon. I think it was before a performance of In a Word. And uh, very possible. Yes. Yeah. It was a long, long time ago. And uh, he and I are in Facebook touch, and <laughs> he's very active on Facebook. He's yeah. he's a very he's a very good supporter. Yeah, he is. Uh, yeah, he likes a lot of our stuff, and he yeah. sees some of these things. And I hope he's watching this. I don't know, 
I think he'll he'll watch it after when it's like posted on on Facebook. That's that's when he watches and then he comments. So okay, we'll put it up. So it was great. I, I remember we did when we were doing King. We we did some. I did a couple of talkbacks with your dad. Yeah. And that was I I always find those so special. Uh, just because it's it's a reminder of of a. I think how how true it is. It's like there there really is a guy who is like. Um, the character you see on stage. And I think it was also really, really special doing it in San Francisco. Like all the other productions, um, you know, it was it was a lot of fun. And and I think the production, those productions were great. But I think this one in particular, um, it, it was kind of just like the cul the culmination of of all that work and an incredibly meta moment oh, totally. um, <laughs> of of being able to do it uh, for the people it was about and yes. not only that but having a lot of just a lot of people who maybe weren't SF Playhouse you know regulars yeah. discover discover this theater and enjoy this play um, I I know my my dad had a great time. Well, yeah. a lot of them will come back. A lot of those people that's great. subscribed and are coming to the shows. Right. It was such it was a real thrill for me I, mm -hmm. to, to be up there with him. He's such a great person. And and it's it, and I, I thought the way he handled the questions, which the inevitable questions about uh, Leland, mm -hmm. you know, and the corruption was so compassionate. He'd say, Well, you know, sometimes people start out and they have a lot of dreams and you know, want to do good and then something goes wrong and they get sidetracked and mm -hmm. it was really it was really neat you know uh, king of the yees and then it was there was an actor playing lauren who was playing lauren and you were in the house yes as there was a father yeah. gomar yeah. playing the father and france yes. coming on and saying i'm the real father but there was actually also the real father yeah. so and and also the fact that it was a homecoming for francis jew too who played my father um yeah. that france francis was born and raised in San Francisco. His parents are San Franciscans. That he also has that long history with the city, and you know that he's you know a really beloved San Francisco actor, even if he you know also lives in New York. Right, and he and he just won Best Actor awards, two Best Actor awards in yes. San Francisco, and two Best Actor yep. awards in uh, in New York. Yes, for. Uh, he was in my play Cambodian Rock Band at Signature Theater in New York, and he was also in uh, David Henry Wong's Soft Power at the Public. So uh, it's it's quite a time for him, you know, especially as an actor who's had a long and celebrated career already. Yeah, what a what a triumph! It was a great mm -hmm. it was a great experience. So this isn't the only play where a daughter's relationship with her dad is is uh, sort of featured, right? There's a couple of others. Yeah, I mean, I think in a way, like if we broaden it to just parent-child relationships, parent -child. the last three plays that I've worked on, uh, King of the Yees, The Great Leap, and Cambodian Rock Band are all um, essentially family plays that, that look at generations and family secrets and and kind of those those type of connections yeah it's pretty wonderful and and, and your dad in particular right was mm -hmm. sort of a character in um in the great leap in a way it is uh it's it's different than king of the yees just in that it's not a it's not a larry yee but it's a larry yee like sort of character <laughs> and of course cambodian rock band that the connection is not nearly so personal no no, I think I think you know there is a father father daughter relationship to that that starts off that you know is akin to like my my relationship with my dad, but it, it's it's uh, the rest of the play like from that starting point it kind of charts very different territory. But it's also they're all they're, in a way they're they all are working on the idea of how do the generations how do we communicate across mm -hmm. across generations and yeah. Well, the King was a very, very specific cultural group that the mm -hmm. story was took place within. Mm -hmm. It was completely universal. Yeah. And everybody got it. You know, mm -hmm. everybody understands. For me, it's particularly poignant because obviously I yeah. have 
very strong relationship yeah. with my daughter and we have fought and played and worked together mm -hmm. for a long, long time and are very close. So the play, it meant a lot to me personally, mm -hmm. you know, as the dad. So what are you working on now? You got some... That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, because we're, we're almost in month two of quarantine um, here in New York. And, and I feel like the past couple months, you know, A, in the very beginning, it was about survival and simply like, where do we get our food and how do we, you know, kind of restructure our lives. And then in the past month, it's been about trying to figure out work habits because my husband and I are in our apartment with our uh, now 17 month old baby who um, is just at a very active age. And so it's been about us trying to figure out uh, how, do, how do we work? Yeah. How, do, how do we carve out time in the day, you know, to give attention to her and also get our work done. So we've been kind of swapping, swapping off. Um, and then in terms of kind of what, what projects I'm working on, um, it's, it's interesting because I, I think there are, there are plays that are kind of on the docket next and like slated for production next season. But a lot of that development, you know, has been put on hold, mm -hmm. waiting to see like when, kind of where the starting line is um, <laughs> and like what, what date that's going to be. And so like that has a domino effect on everything else. Um, and I, and I, and I kind of think that, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to get work done, but at the same time, um, I, I think it's okay to also go easy on myself and let it, like, there's nothing wrong with it, letting some parts of time be fallow and like that, that even, even outside of times of pandemic, there are times when you kind of come off a big project. And you're like, what would I like to do next? And what would be really meaningful? Um, and taking the time to think that through, so. Well, there's quite the, quite the commission, a mill. Can yes. Get to be where an, a, a playwright that, uh, of your stature that has mm -hmm. come up on the national scene and everybody wants to commission you. Yeah. So you can get kind of buried in them. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. a good time to sort of dig out from under that pile. I have, I have, yeah, I have, I have those too, so. Yeah, got a few of them out there. Um, and 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 what what do you think is going to be? What is it? What is in the air? What are we? Uh, you know, I always describe playwrights as the prophets of our time because mm -hmm. I think wow, we all have like kind of more sensitive antenna mm. than the rest of us, and you're able mm -hmm. to reach up into the tumult of information and pull down essential somethings. Yeah. That, and you're also through some synaptical quirk of genius able to turn into a story that we can help us see ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, uh, oh, oh, prophet, what art thou? Uh, what dost thou see? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know yet what people are going to be writing about and what, mm -hmm kind of, the, you know, the themes of the play. I'm sure people are already working on their like coronavirus play. Oh, yeah. um, and and the, those will be out in like a couple <laughs> months, you know, like, and there's gonna be like one or two of them. Right, like really, there were really all 9-11 really plays. plays, right? There yeah. should be like a big, mm -hmm. big volume of 9-11 yeah. plays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I get, but I guess like what I'm, what I'm seeing right now, and we were talking about this a little bit before uh, we went on the air was that, uh, people are finding new ways of working. And I think, you know, not, not ev everything will kind of work, but I think everyone's been given this opportunity and time to experiment with new forms. Like you were talking about the radio play that you guys, and sometimes going back to old forms and old ways of doing uh, that existed before. And, and I think people are coming up with, with ways to make do with what they have, that, that here, are, here are the parameters. We are all, you know, it's, it's almost like, like a kind of MacGyver, like kind of test where you're like, okay, you're all sequestered in your homes. You have this technology, what can you do? And right. I think, 
I think it is true that it, it can be hard to rec recreate something in a different form. Like Zoom, you know, sometimes Zoom plays are hard because you really do, it's, it's just not gonna be the same as, the, as a piece of live theater, which is, which is lovely in a way because everyone's gonna be very excited when you guys are back, on, back in like real life. Um, but it's like, okay, well, if, if Zoom, Zoom readings are difficult, you know, or Zoom theater is difficult, what can you do that makes use, you know, of the form you have in front of them? So like I've seen, I've seen people making music videos out of Zoom that were like incredibly compelling and in certain ways things that you couldn't do um, in real life in this in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those those are really interesting. I'm I'm interested in seeing more. It's yeah. a form, right? That's mm -hmm. in its in its infancy. And yeah. At first we all go, oh God, why can't we have lights and yeah. why can't we have sound and why can't we have our stage? But then yeah. You know, we have to just kind of do what we have mm -hmm. in front of us, you know. Yeah. I've seen a couple of things. I know Lauren Gunderson was talking mm -hmm. about how uh, she, she likes the confessional kind of thing mm -hmm. where, you know, if you're on in a Zoom thing and you're, you're just talking to the people about how you yeah. feel and what you've been through and mm -hmm. what's going on and what's coming up next, mm -hmm. that, that that works well. I saw a collection, it's called 10 by Neil yeah. LeBou, mm -hmm. that is like, 10 mo their monologues mm -hmm. but they're just wonderful and they were well lit and well staged and it was it was interesting the radio play is kind of cool though yeah i think like even within the barrier theater community i know like mina morita and some of the students at uc berkeley did a did a radio play reading of a play by dustin chin um and that seems you know to have gone off really well in some cases like there were aspects of it that were even better as a radio play than, mm -hmm. than you know, live. And then uh, I think some of the students, I remember Peter Quo directed um, a play by uh, Madre Shankar um, on, on Zoom recently. And I think they had a whole, I haven't watched, been able to watch it yet, but I think they had a whole way of doing it. And what he explained is that all the all the audience members are on mute so you know if you're laughing you can't the actors can't hear that but you the audience all has access to the uh, the chat function so right. the audience can interact with each other if they want to like say something or note something you know and the actors don't because they're acting at the time but i was like that's that's really interesting well, that's, uh, I forgot to say that when we started, but the chat function is alive and well here. And if anybody mm -hmm. has a question they want to ask yeah. uh, Lauren, then they can just uh, send it to me via chat. And I yeah. will. Francis, too. Aww. Oh, my goodness. I'm not seeing anything up there for some reason, but whatever. Uh, so just what's uh, another interesting mm -hmm thought is that I like to talk about is it's like the the journey of a play like we did a couple of yours and I think that that they both have pretty pretty like long journeys it's true do you do you mean like from the writing process to being staged right or, yeah like in a word took a long time right? I know there yeah were workshops and workshops and yep workshops and yeah, Tell it's me a little bit about that. How does that work for you? The... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, I think first of all, just in general, I like I like workshops. I like workshopping things with actors. Sometimes even before I really know what I'm doing or where the play is going, I think you know Francis can attest that he's. I think he met King of the Yees really before there was a fully fleshed play. That there were some scenes, and you know, he and I really hadn't worked together before, but he was like, okay, I'll do this and see where it goes. Um, so in the, in the very beginning, I, I rely on a lot of actors trust to be like, okay, I'm going to do this workshop with you. even though we don't have, you know, all of a play or most of a character yet. Um, so I'm always very grateful for that. Um, and then it just, I think it usually, just takes me a lot of drafts to figure out where it's going and what exactly, like kind of by 
you know, taking the raw material and working it and working it, it usually begins to reveal itself. Like so a, that I, music yeah. Took from like the finished first mm -hmm. rough draft until mm -hmm. uh, our production, was that? Yeah, so in a word, I think it started, it, the very beginning of it started 2010 um, as, as, a, as a much smaller one act that I wrote for um, my first year of grad school at UC San Diego. Okay. And interestingly, and you know, we're talking about like creating art with constraints. Uh, it was it was a piece where you only got two or three actors at most, and there you didn't have because you were first year. You didn't have much of a budget. You don't have many props, um, you know, and all the actors are roughly somewhere in their twenties. Um, so you kind of have to be flexible with casting. Um, and so out of those constraints came in a word. And, uh, and I think it's one of those pieces just because it, it's almost like this kind of chamber piece. It's like really difficult to expand or like, cause it's so like tightly constructed that every line is like a reference to like something else um, that uh, I think it, it just took a long time to, to make change the changes that I wanted to. And interestingly, they, they did a production of it recently at the Young Vic in London. And I didn't realize this, but I think the Americanisms are so deeply embedded in this show that they did it, the actor, the British actors did it with American accents. Uh -huh. um, because like that was the only way that all the turns of phrases, which I think are very distinctly American, made sense. Yeah. You there? I am. I am there. I'm. I think I'm finally seeing some of the comments in the. Uh, yeah, the there's chat. a little. I put the yeah. Zoom chat up on yeah. my screen. There you go. Yeah. Jeff is is commenting. You know, Jeff is Francis's brother, and Jeff is on our board of directors. Yeah. So hi, Jeff. Um, so, but one of the things that was unique about our production of In a mm -hmm. Word was that it was the first in a series yes. of three. Right there. Yes. Were, tell us a little bit about that. Was that? Yeah. That revealing and fun to do it yeah so that was uh right. I, I think it was a national new play network right. rolling world premiere um <laughs> into that in 2015 well done and, and it was uh sf playhouse um cleveland public theater and straw dog in chicago and i i thought it was a great experience i got to see all three of them and i think in a word in particular is a play that does really well with wildly different uh, productions that, that I think it, it really, this, that play is an invitation for the director and the designers to make big choices about what, what this world looks like. And so like, there are a couple things that are the same um, or like solutions, you know, that productions will lean towards, but I think, you know, the, the production is really contingent on what the space looks like. And, and so everyone has looked like just beautif beautifully different. But there's a and, lot of room for the, in that play for different directorial approaches. Yeah, yeah. You see different directors take mm -hmm. something. And then it finally got a uh, New York production too, which was, I it heard, did. I heard was just wonderful. Yes, yeah. That was uh, at Le by the company Lesser America, directed by Tyne Raffaelli. And then, and then King uh, started. Now, King mm -hmm. was it was it a commission, Goodman commission? Yeah, it was a Goodman commission. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was really wonderful is that uh, the commission came with a little bit of travel money, where uh, I, my father and I, got to go visit China together. And he had been and I had been, but we'd been separately. And, uh, and we got to, you know, almost like not just for like a couple of days, go to the Yi, the area A, where his parents were from and B specifically like his father's village where he'd visited before. And so he knew where it was. And it was something that like I would have never done on my own just because like I literally could not um and that I think we just wouldn't have prioritized as a family 
but the fact that there was, you know, it was kind of part of my work and that, you know, the theater helped support that, it would made it a different story. And so it was, it was, it was something that, you know, obviously informed the play, but at the same time, it was something that, you know, it's just like, I will take with me for forever, you know, like those, those experience, those experiences. Then the people really took you in, right? They really wel- welcomed you and walked you around and, and took care of you. Oh, do you, at the, at the Goodman? At the village. That's- oh, at the village. Yes. Uh, yes. I think the last time my father went, he like, you know, he, he'd been maybe about five years earlier. Um, and I, I think he like left him a little something. And so they remembered him oh. when he came back with me. Okay. They, they were like this, we like this guy. So you did a workshop at the Goodman, right? Was that yes. the next step? Yes. And they have these really, they're pretty fancy workshops, right? That people come to, right? Their performances and stuff. Oh yeah, uh, the the New Stages Festival. Right. And yeah. It was that mm-hmm. first. And that that is basically a, a festival, kind of over the course of two weeks, where they they have three plays that are in process, mm-hmm. and you get two weeks of rehearsal and two weeks of performances, like six performances over two week. And Francis was a part of that. Right. Um, and it was one of those things where like the process is so wild and the constraints are, are so tight that you kind of can't help but infuse it with all the joy and frenetic energy, um, you know, that something like that should have, that we had to like make it with whatever was there as quickly as we could. Cause I think it just, you know, it, it helps fight those feelings of self-censorship or like making it polished and perfect. That well, you're kind a, little, of, uh, a little sandbox like. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Then they did a full production the next year. Yeah. Right. And then was it another year before it went to LA? Uh, it was. Let's see, I think I think it was a couple months later. So it was uh, the Goodman production was uh, April two thousand seventeen, and then by July two thousand seventeen, it went to Center Theater Group. And then finally comes home. Yeah. That was like a five. And Josh and Francis were with the show the whole time. Yeah, Josh and Francis and actually uh, Nisha Fixel, the sound designer. Who, who just won the sound designer. Yes. yes. Well deserved. Very. You know, so he and Josh were working on that sound design mm-hmm. for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Well, um, so any other thoughts that you have about the about the immediate future of playwriting in America? Is, are we gonna change? Is this all gonna change us in some way that'll be remarkable? Or I guess it's hard to see at this point. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's inevitable that it, that it will change us or shape us in some way. Um, I, think, I think, you know, who knows when we will be able to return to theater, you know, as it was three months ago. Uh, But I think storytellers are storytellers. And, and we've, you know, over time, we have been given radio, we have been given television, we've been given just new for new ways of doing it new forms. And I think we're going to continue to find new ways of making. Um, And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, I think, tomorrow and we don't have to be as productive or working at you know the same level as we did a couple months ago because right now you know there's also a lot of other pressing concerns but uh but i but i feel like we will always find new ways of working yeah i I mean i read somewhere recently that uh, shakespeare's latest and greatest Mm -hmm. plays were all written as when the plague was yeah raging through london yeah. Interesting. It's a challenging time and and you're right. Stories will be told. Mm-hmm. You know, we will never stop. We can't. Like stories yeah. are embedded in our DNA. You know, I like to say that people need four things to survive. They need shelter, uh-huh. water, food, and stories. Mm-hmm. 
But I, but I will say none of us should feel pressure to have to like write King Lear during this pandemic. Like, <laughs> you know, for any, for anyone watching, if you need to like make a pizza and clean your house, like that's the good too. Yeah. Yeah. We have to enjoy the moments. I think almost more than anything, enjoy the moments we have. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. It was really fun for me and I hope the people that watch got something out of it. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me uh, uh, with, with your uh, fireplace. There's, I My don't know if you've yeah. mentioned it, but I was like, there's a, there's a real fireplace for this fireside yeah. chat. I like it's it. Burning at the moment because I forgot okay. to turn it on, but that's okay. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, next week, folks, we are going to have Mr. Octavio Solis. Mm. Uh, with us to talk about the things that he's thinking and the process of writing, how that works for him. And the following week, we're going to have Stephen Adley Gerges uh, join us from, from New York. It's a little late there, yeah. but not too late, right? Ten, a little after 10. Yeah. 10 good enough. But we'll have Stephen here. Um, also, would really uh, love to encourage you all to to sign up for our uh, YouTube channel, um, first of all, so you can hear about upcoming things. We're going to start up a new series of little short, I'm calling them Zoomlets, which are going to be two-person plays with a director. So the director will introduce them and why he or she picked the play, give a little word to the actors, do the play, and then talk about it a little after. So we'll, we'll focus on short plays. And it'll be kind of like being a fly on the wall at a first reading is what I'm hoping for. Uh, so, so stay tuned for that. Also, uh, we are actively seeking subscriptions for next season. So we hope you'll do that. And uh, always happy for help uh, getting us through. Now more than ever, we're trying to keep theater alive. And as you can imagine, it's a huge challenge for us uh, to get through these summer months and plan what's going to be coming. We just started a really cool new way of giving. It's called our Empathy Gym membership. And it's for people who can give like $5 or $10 or $25 a month. And it's a way I think you get like a bag or a hat or a sticker. And it's kind of a fun way of, of getting more involved. So uh, thank you once again, Lauren. And thank you, uh, Donnie for being our uh, engineer and thank you all for joining us for the fireside chats at the empathy gym and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Bill. Bye. Bye.